this video, we're going to talk a little bit about voting theory. So the first thing I want to introduce is called a preference table. And this is an example of one here. It's a convenient and easy way to group lots of voters' preferences so we don't have to write down every single person's opinions. For example, what this preference table is telling us is that there are eight people who have A as their first choice, B as their second, and C as their third, while there are seven people that have C as their first, B as their second, and A as their third. So we have a total of 20 people's votes and opinions represented in this table. Now we're going to define a couple of terms. Majority, we hear this a lot, majority rules. Well, majority is greater than 50%. It can be one person more than 50%, but you have to have more than 50% for a majority. And many times we don't really have majority rules. We have plurality. Plurality means the most votes wins, but if it was a majority, it, a majority wouldn't be a plurality, but a plurality could be less than a majority win as well. Now, for example, in this table here, if we just get to you know put a name in a hat and vote, like we often vote, A would get eight votes, C would get seven, and B would get five because people would vote their first place, uh, first choice. So clearly A would win. A does not have a majority. He has eight out of 20 votes. But A does have a plurality, so that would be a plurality, plurality win. Now one thing that can happen, and particularly in just a one vote system, we can run into a situation where some voters might have a reason to do strategic voting. And that means they vote for something other than their first choice for some strategic reason. And let's look at this chart here. These groups of voters here, the seven and this five voters here, have A as their last choice. And that A is what they're going to get. A is going to win a plurality. Now C is only one vote behind. We have five voters over here who would prefer to have C over A. But their first choice is B. However, if they vote strategically, if they are aware of all this information, and they say, look, we're not going to win. Our candidate is the least popular. Let's switch our votes to C. And if two of these five voters decided to use that strate strategy, they would give two more votes to C, and C would win with nine over A's eight. So that would be a strategic vote, and it would be in their best interest to do so. So there's a logical reason to vote other than your first choice in a voting system like this. So given that most times we think about voting, we think about one man, one woman, one vote, we have a plurality win with someone with less than a majority, we might ought to consider other voting systems which would maybe not be so susceptible to the, someone who's not very popular winning. If we look here, 12 people really don't like A at all, and yet A would win in a single vote system. So the first next choice we're going to look at is runoff systems. And there's a couple of different ways we could do a runoff. One version would be to keep two candidates with the most votes. So in this case, A and C would be the two candidates we keep. Now this is a simple example. So the other runoff is actually going to be the same thing, just because there's only three candidates. The sequential runoff, you get rid of the lowest vote receiving the candidate, and then you repeat the election. Obviously, keeping the two best and getting rid of the worst is the same thing when you have three people. So you would get rid of B and redo the election. Now these voters, when their candidate B is gone, they're going to vote for their second choice, C. And so in either of these two types of runoffs, we could see what would happen. Some other systems that we're going to consider are a uh, point system, often called a board account. And maybe we could give three points for a first place vote, two for a second, and one for a third. That way, even your second and third place uh, opinions would still matter in the system. And another system that is, that is out there is pairwise comparisons, where you try and find a candidate who can beat every other candidate in a one-on-one -on -one election. Well, looking at our results, as mentioned, in a plurality system, A would win with eight votes. In a runoff, either type of runoff in this case would be the same thing. B would get eliminated, and those five votes would switch to C, the second place choice, and C would win either type of runoff. <coughs> in a pairwise comparison, it is easy to do, and even when the charts get bigger, you simply count through all the votes and see who would win. So for example, B versus C. B would beat C on these eight votes. C would beat B for seven. B beats C for 5. So 5 and 8 is 13 to 7. B beats C. And you'll, you'll generally want to write those down and add them up. I'm just talking my way through the simple example. But in a longer example, you'll want to write B versus C and simply count up which ones go for B and which ones go for C. Now looking at a point system, and you can uh, verify this, um, I counted up 36 points for A, 45 for B, and 39 for C. So B wins a point system here. So we've got three different possible winners so far, even this very simple example. In a plurality, A wins. In a runoff, B is eliminated and C wins. And yet in a point system, B wins. 
And so, and these systems all have legitimate reasons that you might consider using them, depending on the type of election you're looking at. So, seeing this complexity that shows up to the simple question of voting, uh, people started considering, what does the word fair mean? What is a mathematical criteria for a fair election? And several points were sort of postulated and agreed on. If you have a majority, you should win. You should never lose to someone that you could beat head to head. So for example, B should not lose to A here because head to head, A would beat B. And, and several, there's around four criteria depending on which system and there have been some discussions of different criteria that, are this, that turn out to be the same. But this leads us to a famous conjecture in voting theory. It's called the Arrow Conjecture. No voting system can guarantee fairness all of the time for all possible elections. So this means no matter what system you have, you could have an election where a candidate wins and another candidate could say, hey, that's not fair. I should have been able to beat that candidate. Now this gets misinterpreted a lot. This means no system can be fair 100% of the time. But that doesn't mean an election can't be fair. An election certainly can be fair. An individual, if one person's most popular compared to anyone else, he'll probably win every type of system. And some systems are fair a lot of the time, and some systems are more fair than others. So th the thing to take from this conjecture is we're never going to have a perfect election setup where everyone can agree that every election turned out with the, the winner who should win winning. But you can't say that every election is unfair. Many elections under any system will be fair. Some systems will provide for fairness more often than others.